You're watching The Legal Breakdown. So we've got a really big update in the Trump trial that we're going to discuss today. But first, just a quick reminder for those watching, Glenn and I are doing daily comprehensive coverage of the entirety of this trial. So if you want to follow along with everything that's happening, please make sure to subscribe. Okay, Glenn, we got a huge update here. This may be it. Can you talk about the new schedule for this trial? Yeah, it's a little bit surprising that Michael Cohen, it looks like, will be the last witness for the prosecution. And that actually tells us a lot about how Michael Cohen is performing. Going into this week, the prosecutors said they believed they were going to have at least two more witnesses to present to the jury. But then there was an update uh, today, and they, the prosecutors told Judge Mershon that Michael Cohen will be the last witness. They have decided not to call whoever the other unidentified witness was going to be. What can we glean from that? You know, one of the things that I always taught my prosecutors when I was supervising federal prosecutors is you want to start strong, but almost more importantly, you want to end strong. When you close the government's case, when you, it's called resting the government's case in chief, the very last witness you called, you want to go out with a bang. You want to give the jury something that they can hold on to that is some of your best, most persuasive, most compelling evidence. The fact that the prosecutors have decided to end with Michael Cohen tells me that his performance was strong, perhaps even stronger than they expected. Now, one of the problems is there are no cameras in the courtroom. So, of course, we're relying on the reporting and lots of great reporting is coming out of the courtroom in real time. It sounds like Michael, Michael Cohen performed not only well on the substance, right, the actual evidence that he brought to the jury's attention, but also his demeanor was reported as being very calm, very even-handed, sort of very respectful. And if anybody's listened to Michael Cohen on this podcast, I've been on with him on his podcast. I know you have, Brian. He can get loud. He can get um, uh, very forward-leaning in what he says and how he says it. A lot of choice words are usually included in his, uh, his podcast. Um, but that is, by all accounts, not the way he's been performing in court. And that's a good thing. I'm sure he took the, the advice of the prosecutors to heart about, you know, how they would like to see him perform as a witness. And, you know, then when you look at some of the substance of his testimony, not only on direct examination, when the prosecutor was asking him the questions, but on cross-examination, he seems to really be holding his own and then some on cross-examination. Of course, we're only perhaps halfway or not even halfway through cross-examination. But what everybody should keep in mind, whatever the defense attorneys for Donald Trump ask him on cross-examination, the government gets the last word with its witness. So it will have a redirect examination where they will be able to delve into and clean up any sort of damage or any lingering questions that might have been left open during cross-examination. And again, this is an indication that the prosecution is feeling very good about its case. Now, Glenn, we spoke yesterday about how effective Michael Cohen's testimony was for prosecutors. You, you said that it was a 9 out of 10. Um, today, it was the defense's job to basically cut him down and, and undermine all of that effectiveness. So you, you dug into that a little bit. But overall, how do you think how do you think they did at that part? I mean, their, their goal right now is to leave a lasting impression with the jurors that undermines all of the good work that he did uh, for prosecutors previously. So would you say that they were successful at that or unsuccessful at undermining his effectiveness? Based on what I read of the cross-examination, I think the defense attorney, Todd Blanche, struggled to make any headway with Michael Cohen. There are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, the prosecutors did exactly what experienced prosecutors do on direct examination with the witness. They fronted the bad stuff. They talked about Michael Cohen lying previously. They talked about his criminal convictions. They talked about, you know, how he has said some terrible things about Donald Trump. Terrible, but understandable. Like the, I would like that big orange windbag to go to prison. Well, sure, because Michael Cohen committed crimes for the benefit of and at the direction of Donald Trump. And he, Michael Cohen, went to prison for it. But Donald Trump thus far did, has not gone to prison. You can understand why Michael Cohen would like to see some accountability come Donald Trump's way right. for the get, crimes they committed together. Get in line, get in line. <laughs> yeah, so 
I think the prosecutors did a great job of what we call drawing the sting, because if the prosecution is the first one to tell the jury about the weaknesses in their case and in a particular witness's testimony, then when the defense attorneys stand up and start cross-examining Michael Cohen on, well, wait a minute, you lied. You know, the jury saying to themselves, e yeah, the prosecutors already told us that, but they provided the corroboration, the other evidence from witnesses and documents and cell phone records and false ledger entries and reimbursement checks signed by Donald Trump out of the Oval Office repaying Michael Cohen. So how about you get to something that's actually helpful and germane, Mr. Defense Attorney? This is the internal dialogue. You know, I, I sat there for 30 years and watched the wheels turn in the heads of jurors, and I could tell how certain things were landing, sometimes by their facial expression, by their body language. So I, I think because the prosecution did a really good job of drawing the sting, some of Todd Blanche's cross-examination fell flat, at least as I read it on the cold reporting. Here's the other thing. People may not know that just because you're an experienced prosecutor, and I believe Todd Blanche was a prosecutor for about 10 years, um, does not mean you're going to be an effective defense attorney. In <laughs> right. fact, Brian, I have worked with so many prosecutors who left prosecution and went over to the defense side, and I will say more often than not, they were not the best defense attorneys. You know, prosecutors deal with what is, right? What is the evidence? Defense attorneys deal with what might be, what could have been, what should have been, but not what is or what was. Because what is or what was is what incriminated the, the <laughs> defendant, got him indicted, and landed him in the defendant's chair in a courtroom. So, you know, defense attorneys need to be creative, and they typically are way more creative than prosecutors. They need to think outside the box. Prosecutors build up a case brick by brick. All a defense attorney has to do is knock out a few of the bricks make the building a little shaky, and then argue to the jury in closings that, you know what, the government didn't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. So what I will, I'll say it again, in my experience, former prosecutors don't make the best criminal defense attorneys. And I think Todd Blanche proved that to be true in his cross-examination today. By my reading, it fell flat. It was meandering. He didn't seem to have a theme. He didn't seem to be building to anything. Now, I don't know, maybe he's withholding all the good stuff for the next day when he gets to complete his cross-examination of Michael Cohen, but I'm actually betting not. Well, digging into that a little bit, there was a moment where Trump's lawyer, Todd Blanche, he started lambasting Michael Cohen on the stand for attacking him, meaning the attorney. He was bringing up instances where Michael Cohen attacked Todd Blanche, and the judge called called him up for a sidebar and was basically like, what are you doing, man? This, this case isn't about you. Why are you trying to make it about you? Can you speak on that moment? Because that really struck me that perhaps <laughs> Trump's attorneys don't know what they're doing. Yeah, you know, Brian, I, I read that exchange and it was kind of Bush League because when Todd Blanche started cross-examining Michael Cohen with, well, you called me mean names. I forget what the exact name was that Michael Cohen called Todd Blanche somewhere along the way. And there was an objection and Mershon said, yeah, sustained, right? Move on. When a defense attorney begins to, or, or when the jury begins to sense that the defense attorney is taking things personally, and now you're going to start asking the witnesses about, you know, names he may have called you, the defense attorney, that's more a sign of weakness than a sign of strength. I think it landed poorly, uh, as evidenced by the fact that Judge Mershon sustained the objection and, you know, did not want to get into that kind of a sideshow. And, and let me tell you, there have been lots of questions during the course of the trial that I have heard. Why, why isn't the prosecutor objecting more? Why isn't the defense attorney objecting more? Here's what I'll tell you my rule of thumb was. If it didn't hurt my case as a prosecutor, I didn't object. Or if it was inadmissible in the form in which it was asked, but I knew they could rework the form in a follow-up question and get the same information out, I didn't object. Yeah. Why? because sometimes jurors will look at a party who objects too often and say, why are they trying to hide evidence from us? And it is the attorney's obligation to object. But you know what? I tried to be 
uh, I, I tried to very sparingly object. Only if I knew it was absolutely inadmissible evidence, I believed it was going to hurt my case, because I think when attorneys are always jumping up out of their chairs and yelling objection, the, the jurors begin to feel like, wait a minute, why is he or she trying to keep all this information from us? All right, so Glenn, at this point, bring us through a, a timeline of what we can expect if Michael Cohen does end up being the final witness here. What, what are next steps in this trial? When will ju ju the jury have a chance to deliberate? Uh, walk us through this. Yeah, so interesting. It's a little bit in the hands of the defense attorneys and Donald Trump now. Why do I say that? Because originally they signaled that they were going to be calling lots of witnesses. But, you know, we got a hint in court today that they may actually call no witnesses. There was a discussion between Donald Trump's defense attorneys and Judge Mershon, and they said, well, you know what, Your Honor, depending on what you decide to include in some of the jury instructions, even the one expert witness that we were contemplating calling, we may not call them. Uh, and so they signaled they may not have any witnesses to call. Now, here's what they added. Of course, we haven't yet made our decision with respect to whether our client will testify or not. Yes, they have, and he won't. Donald right. Trump will not hit the stand. I'll put a dollar and a nickel on that <laughs> one. And you know one dollar is my yep. betting limit, Brian. So yep. I'm pretty confident Donald Trump is not going to want to subject himself to cross-examination. So, so to your question, you know, we could see closing arguments, I would say, as early as Monday morning, and we could see the case in the hands of the jury by the middle of next week. Okay, well, obviously things are ramping up pretty quickly now. So for those watching, if you want to follow along as this trial winds down and as we get closer and closer to a conviction by this jury, please make sure to subscribe. The links to both of our channels are right here on the screen. I'm Brian Tyler Cohen. And I'm Glenn Kirshner. You're watching The Legal Breakdown.